Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallillahu ma'ala Sayyidina Muhammad. An Nabiya Lumi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Rabbana atina min ladunka rahma. Wa hayyik lana min amrina rashada. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sami'u al-alim. Wa tuba alayna innaka anta al-tawabu al-rahim. Rabbi adkhilni mudkhala sitqin wa akhrijni mukhraja sitqin. Wa ja'alni min ladunka sultan al-nasira. Ya Fattah ya Alim iftah lana fathan qariba. يا فتح يا عليم افتح لنا فتحا قريبا يا فتح يا عليم افتح لنا فتحا قريبا لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد النبي لمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Alhamdulillah, wa shukrillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the immense blessings that we're experiencing right now and we ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the greatest blessing of ikhlas that we are sincere to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala that we direct our hearts not to nothing but Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and His majesty and His glory and that we ask Him to <coughs> send peace and blessings upon our Master Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and His family, companions and every follower of His sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until the end of time uh, alhamdulillah wa shukrillah. So it's really such an honor to be here in the honors program. And uh, uh, it really, you know, it was raining, and a lot of people were pointing out that it started right when Imam Zaid started teaching. And one of the things that uh, we learn from the Quran is to perceive signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That <clears throat> Allah ta'ala, uh, that the Quran is constantly encouraging us, demanding from us that we reflect. And that one of the beautiful ayahs in this regard is Fanlur ila athari rahmatillah in Surah Al Rum. Fanlur ila athari rahmatillah. That look and reflect. Nadar meaning to see, but also to see with the heart. Because there's two types of sight in our tradition. There's the sight of the eye, which is called basar, and there's the sight of the heart which is called basira from the same root. And so the outward sight is used to see in the physical realm, and the inward sight is used to perceive meaning from the physical realm. That the basira is really when the eye of the basira starts to open, then we start to examine and reflect upon meaning that inundates this entire cosmos. And that in this particular verse, fun dur, so look with both the outward and the inward eyes, ila athari rahmatillah upon the traces of divine grace, upon the traces of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Mufassireen, many of them mention in fact that the athar here refers to rain. That rain is something to really reflect on. And that uh, where does the rain come from? Who's sending down the rain? And that one of the things we'll learn inshallah in this course is that we affirm the means of the world. We affirm that there are things that have effects, at least from what we can perceive, but the reality of that is that it is Allah Ta'ala's creation, that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala is the creator of everything in this cosmos. And so, فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Look upon the traces of the mercy of Allah. That while we can empirically note that there are uh, physical explanations for phenomena such as rain. The Quran is trying to, oh, that's from the Basar, but the Quran is uh, calling us to open the Basira, to open the eye of the heart, and to see that there is a deep meaning. There is a deep meaning in all, in all of the events of the physical realm. So it's from the traces of Allah's Rahmah. And one of the things about our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that when it would rain, he actually, most people like to go cover themselves, that he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would actually go out and expose his blessed body, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his chest, and experience the rain. And that he would say, كَمَا قَالْ Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam دَا إِنَّهُ حَدِيثُ أَهْدٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِ That verily this is freshly created from its Lord. It's just a recent 
It was just with Allah. In no hadith of Ahlim and Rabbi. So he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his basira, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the basira that is most open of all of the creatures of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and he is seeing the athar of Allah's rahmah. And so, you know, with that, just to reflect deeply and to notice these signs, and that this is really the Quranic argument for uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's attributes, primarily, which implies his existence is to reflect on these signs, is to reflect on these signs. And in the West, this is called an argument from design. And inshallah, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it in detail. And so divine mercy, you know, right when we start this program, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending a reminder of his mercy and something really to reflect on. So we ask Allah ta'ala to bestow upon us his grace and mercy. And that we know from the hadith that when believers get, gather together for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there is a rahmah that comes down. There is a rahmah that comes down and envelops the gathering. And that there is a sakina, a tranquility that comes as well. And that there is an angelic presence, that the angels are here, inshallah. And that there is ultimately the best of things, which is that Allah remembers us. That when we, when we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah remembers us. So, alhamdulillah wa shukrillah, uh, we're really honored to be here. And we ask Allah ta'ala to put ta'zeem in our hearts to create a veneration for his religion and the knowledge of his religion uh, in our hearts. This course, inshallah, will be um, going through the, the Johrat Tawheed, which is translated as the pearl or the precious pearl of divine unity. And uh, just to mention a little bit about the author before we begin, um, some initial reflections. The, the author, his name is Sheikh Ibrahim ibn Ibrahim ibn Hassan Abu al-Imdad al-Mulaqab bi Burhan al-Din al So his name is Ibrahim ibn Ibrahim uh, Burhan al-Din, which translates as the absolute demonstrative proof of the religion. The Burhan is the undeniable proof whose premises are based on certainty. So he's, the Burhan is the ultimate proof. So he is, his laqab, his title that he's given, Allah be pleased with him, is Burhan al-Din. And then his name is Al-Laqani. And Laqana is a uh, village in Egypt. And that, um, you know, many of our masters and scholars and, um, you know, luminant uh, or eminent luminaries of this tradition were from Egypt. Egypt is a very blessed land. And that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, send his mercy and peace and tranquility on that land and all the lands of the Muslims that Imam Laqani rahimahullah was from there and they say that one of his ancestors was by the name of Muhammad ibn Harun who was well known to be a saintly figure they say Al-Wali al-Shahir so something to uh, think about and inshallah we'll talk about today that theology there is a rational component of uh, reasoning discursive reasoning dialectical to prove uh, the existence of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of God and his attributes. But then there's a theology of realization when that translates into the lives of saintly figures. And so Imam al-Laqani, rahimahullah, one of the things they mention about him is that he and his, his family, they actually were from a tribe that had a connection, a lineage to the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that However, he never manifested that. He kept that, he kept that hidden. And they say tawadu'an, that this was out of his humility. This was out of his humility. And I believe Imam Zaid, Allah protect him, spoke about this earlier of tawadu' and how with Imam Nawawi, we can see this. With Imam Laqani, we can see this. With all the great, great ones whose names we mention today and read their works today, we learn about their humility and that really at the heart of this religion is lowering ourselves because Allah is the only one whose name deserves to be exalted. So that the word of Allah reigns supreme. So that the word of Allah reigns supreme and nothing else. And so uh, I was once with one of my teachers who is uh, very, mashallah, well known for his teaching publication and transformation of his students. And... Uh, a family member was meeting him and said, what an honor to meet you, Sheikh, that you've done so much for this religion. And, uh, you know, really, uh, it, you know, we've heard so many good things about you. 
And immediately, without hesitation, his response was, if you think about it, the only ones whose uh, name deserves praise and they're they actually deserve it because of who they are is Allah and His Messenger. That was his immediate response to being praised. Is that everyone else falls short. Everyone else, that the image of, of creation that we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of His names is as sattar And that He subhanahu wa ta'ala is veiling our faults. That if Allah ta'ala would lift the veils and we would see the realities of many of us, it would it would be something that would turn us off from each other. That from, from the traces of His mercy is the fact that He veils our faults and He allows for tawbah. He allows us to turn back to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and edit, as it were, the mistakes that we make. So that on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, when the, when the biography, when our films are played before us, the ard, and we see our lives being uh, played before us, that inshallah our mistakes will be edited. They won't even show up. And we will think that, well, I slipped that one day. It's not showing up. And Allah, inshallah, will tell us it's because of your tawbah. That I am a tawab. And it completely, the tawbah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely erases uh, our mistakes. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a sattar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a tawab. And so, uh, you know, really to, to, um, to have humility and to, to realize our shortcomings. That some of our masters, they would pray two rakahs of nafil. Two, two rounds of voluntary prayer, and at the end of it, they would have a sense as if they just committed theft. This is mentioned in our tradition, that some of our masters, after, after doing a good deed, their personal feeling was as if they just committed a crime. Not because the prayer, the prayer is exalted, not because of the act, but because of their performance of the act. Is that one of the realities of humility, one of the realities of... Uh, of ubudiya, essentially, of being a true servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taqseer, is to see yourself as falling short, is to see yourself as falling short. And the moment we see ourselves as achieving anything, the moment we perceive ourselves as achievers of anything, then we've truly fallen short. That's the point where we've truly fallen short. But if we see ourselves as falling short, that's true achievement. If we see ourselves as falling short, that's true achievement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to, to protect ourselves from ujab, from being impressed with ourselves. So to return to uh, our eminent Imam, Rahimullah Al-Laqani, that they say about him that he was, uh, he was a master of hadith and he was an ocean in theology, tabahara. And they say that and to the extent that he was considered a marja, someone to go to when there were difficult issues that people couldn't understand or there were difficult fatawa of his time in Cairo, that he was a marja, he was someone that they would go to. So humility does not negate uh, success or intellectual achievement, that we strive to learn and we strive to be successful in whatever endeavors we're engaging in. And particularly with knowledge of the religion, we should, we should really you know, do the mujahada of, of uh, studying it diligently. But the entire time we should see it as fandur ila athari rahmatillah. You see that we put forth the effort in whatever endeavor we're doing for the sake of Allah, but the heart the whole time is seeing it as look at the traces of Allah's mercy upon us. Look at the fact that I'm learning. Look at the fact that I, you know, I'm able to do whatever I'm able to do. Look at this project that Allah gifted me. You know, spend months and months and months, day and night, working, trying to get the project launched and finally it's launched and successful, the true uh, servant, the person of Ubudiyah to Allah, sees it as فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ They hear the call of Allah, look at the traces of Allah's mercy on you. That this is true Ubudiyah. Never to ascribe success to ourselves. Never to ascribe achievement to ourselves. Because who's the one giving us tawfiq? Who's the one giving us the ability to do what we do? Who's the one creating every single muscle contraction and action potential and thought that occurs in our minds. Who's the one that creates memory? How does, how does memory work? How is it the fact that I can look at something, repeat it to myself a few times, and suddenly I have it in my head? How, how does that work? And the reality of that we know now in biology and neuroscience is it's simply molecules attaching. It's sodium attaching to receptor and gates opening and potassium flooding in and you have these molecules moving and suddenly I know something. 
how can I, am I controlling those molecules? Am I making sure they attach correctly? That one single cell is an entire universe of events. One single cell is an entire universe of events. And so I have billions and billions and billions of these actions happening at every moment. And the result of it is some sort of success, a mental cognition, a thought, a memory that I've learned. Yani, how can we as ascribe that to ourselves? It's a crime. It's a crime. That Allah Ta'ala says, Kalla inna al insana la yatgha ar ra'ahu stagna. In Surah Al Alaq, Kalla, verily, inna al insana la yatgha. The human being is a criminal. Ar ra'ahu stagna. For the fact that he thinks he's independent. For the mere fact that he thinks he's without need. For a moment to think that we're not in utter need of Allah is a crime in Islam. It's a crime in Islam. And so, really, to be realized in this, to realize that, so we put forth the effort and we see it as from the traces of divine mercy. And then they mention about Imam Laqani rahimahullah that he was Adim al Hayba, that he was someone of tremendous Hayba. And Hayba is a type of awe that whenever he was seen, people would have this veneration in the heart for him. And this is again because he's reflecting the divine attributes. That the, the, the beloved وسلم, said, that inculcate in yourselves traits that are that mirror or reflect the divine traits, the divine attributes. And this can never be in a real sense because Allah is transcendent above anything in this world, time, space, physicality, etc. But that within our limits to reflect these attributes. And so he was, when he, uh, when he inculcates in himself the, uh, the traits of generosity and lutf, and all of the virtues of the religion, then Allah Ta'ala creates a hayba for him. And that's specifically with tawadu. Is that, uh, as the hadith I believe Imam Zaid quoted this morning, that, uh, man tawada alillah, ma tawada ahadun lillah illa rafa'uhullah, in Sahih Muslim, that no one ever lowers themselves for the sake of Allah, except that Allah elevates them. And so what's the basis of him having a hayba? Not that we should seek a hayba, not that we should seek that people think special of us, but if Allah Ta'ala gifts it to someone, the basis is because internally they don't have any respect, any sort of veneration for themselves. They don't see themselves as special. They respect themselves for the fact that they are a creation of Allah and Bani Adam is dignified. And so from the perspective of being Allah's creation, they have a type of self-respect and a dignity that comes with that. But they don't attribute any sort of talent to themselves independently, that the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are in a state of faqr, of uh, need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every moment. So they say about him that he was also qawi wa nafs, he was someone of fortitude. He, was, he had a strong uh, uh, personality in the sense of uh, he was courageous, he was courageous. And that to the extent that the political figures of his time would humble themselves in his presence and that even they would accept his intercession. If he interceded on behalf of someone, they would accept it. And he did not seek them out, but they would seek him out. And this is the nature of scholarship, is that they say, the Salaf used to say that the, scholars, the scholar is someone that even the kings will seek him out. Right? The scholar is someone that even the kings will seek him out, because knowledge is, is, is empowerment, and specifically knowledge of the most important things, which are, فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ So, and then they mentioned about him that his entire concern was to, he was devoted to teaching. He was devoted to teaching and, uh, and writing to, to serve the sacred knowledge. And they say about him, كَانَ جَامِعًا بَيْنَ الْحَقِيقَ وَالشَّرِيعَةِ That he was someone that he, he gathered both uh, the outward of the sacred law and the inward realities. And so he was someone that, um, it was not simply lip service. It was not simply, you know, his learning and teaching was not simply, uh, you know, outward, something of the outward, but internally he was realized in these realities. And his theology, as we will learn inshallah, was something that translated to, the, to his state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result of that, they say that he had many karamat, which are uh, saintly miracles, that are honorary miracles, that they're not... Uh, uh, prophetic miracles that's called the mu'jiza and we'll learn about this inshallah it's actually in our aqidah uh, almost every aqidah text that I've come across has a section on the karamat of the awliya the miracles of the saintly people the people closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah we'll cover that in this course 
that it's different from a prophet because a prophet, when he comes with a miracle, that that's conjoined with his claim to prophecy. And so the miracle is, is in effect, Allah's statement that my servant is true in what he conveys of me. Sadaqabti fima balagani. Whereas a miracle of a wali, of a saint, a member of, an, of the ummah, of a prophet, is simply a reflection of that prophet and his miracle. Essentially, it is still a, a miracle of that prophet because the basis of the saint having a miracle is his following the way of that prophet, following the way of the prophet from whose ummah he is in. And so uh, Imam Laqani was known uh, for that as well, rahimahullah ta'ala. And then in terms of the text, he wrote this text. Um, he called it Jawharat Tawheed and the Precious Pearl of Unity. And they say he, he wrote it in one night. He wrote the whole thing, 144 lines, with all of the meanings that it has that we will get a taste of, inshallah, in one night. And the basis of it was that his sheikh, his uh, spiritual mentor, gave him an ishara that he advised them you should write uh, something in the science of Aqidah. And that this really, if you see uh, scholars in our tradition of immense tawfiq whose works lasted and the benefit was manifest in their time and in generations that followed, that there was always a connection to a deep spirituality and the connection of the people of spirituality. That there's a difference between someone on their own saying, oh, you know, I want to work on so-and-so and then just starting and doing it. And there could be tawfiq in that. But versus uh, to be connected to the people of Allah, really to be connected to the people of Allah and the pious of Allah and those that are closest to, to Allah. And just even, even it's, if it's merely informing them, saying, I, I wish to work on this project and I'd like to get your du'as and blessings on it, that when they give that, the barakah is just different. And this is something that the ulama talk about and it's seen here as an example in the Jawhara. And so after he finished writing it, rahimahullah ta'ala, he showed it to his, his spiritual mentor and he, the, his teacher praised it. And he made dua for Imam Laqani and to anyone that used this text forever. That the dua of his teacher is lasting with the text. Wherever the text goes and is taught and is learned, inshallah it's infused with the dua of blessing from that teacher. And, uh, and specifically benefit, that he prayed for benefit. And one of the things to reflect on is that, you know, often we see, uh, you know, great scholars with so much knowledge, and it, it's very humbling to see ulama of tremendous, tremendous knowledge. And the mind starts to think about just amount of knowledge, that I need to learn a whole bunch of knowledge because that's the way a scholar is. They have a tremendous amount of knowledge. And that's true, we don't negate that, that surely there has to be a tremendous amount of knowledge for someone to be uh, a real scholar. But uh, something that's unique to our tradition is that the real focus is on benefit. The real focus is on benefit. And that Allah Ta'ala could give to a person of much lesser knowledge a benefit that's far superior vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a scholar of much greater knowledge, that this is possible and this happens a lot. And so really the dua we should make, in addition to increase in knowledge, which is from the Qur'an, Rabbi zidni ilma, we don't deny that, but in addition to that we should sincerely ask Allah to put benefit in our knowledge, and we should seek that benefit, and that Allah Ta'ala is the one that grants benefit. And so uh, it's interesting here that, the, that that was specifically the dua of the teacher of Imam Laqani for this, for this poem. And that Imam Laqani then started teaching it, and in one day he wrote 500 copies of it by hand. Right. This is this is and this is back before word and printing and all of these things. And that he wrote three commentaries on his poem and uh one of them is actually available today in print. And then he has many other works. He has books uh, a book on the Ajrumiya and grammar, a book on uh hadith, he has a book on the Shama'il, he had a uh, work on Fatawa and various works of various uh, treatises on fiqh. And then he died in ten forty one Hijri which is about 400 years ago, rahimahullah ta'ala, and that there was a tremendous, inshallah, qabul, acceptance in his, um, in his poem. And the fact that we are honored to uh, read it today, inshallah, here in this place in California, is a sign of the, of the acceptance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him, rahimahullah ta'ala. In terms of the name of the, of the text, Jawhara at tawheed so Jawhara means the precious pearl. And the commentators talk about how you know, that really 
what's more precious than Tawheed? And it's something to reflect upon today in, a day, in an age of everything but Tawheed, right? In an age of ideology, in an age of philosophy, in an age of nihilism, in an age of materialism, in an age of scientism and atheism and reductionist approaches to knowledge and, and all of these isms and etc., etc., and in an age of many false theologies that to have this johara, to have this precious, precious pearl, that just to, just to reflect what exactly is the value of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That the kalima, something that outweighs everything on the scales, on yawm al-qiyamah. Nothing can outweigh the kalima. And that it is really the ticket to eternal salvation. That the kalima is really even a person with a mustard seed, according to the hadith, a mustard seed or an iota of faith will be sa- saved, will be eventually, if they have to go to the fire, taken out of the fire and then have eternal felicity. So it's the key to eternity. And that, as a small example, that Sidi Abu Hassan al-Shadili, Allah be pleased with him, that he was reported to have said that were the spiritual light in the heart of a sinful believer, a disobedient believer, if the, if the light in his heart or her heart were unveiled for us, he said it would fill everything between the heavens and earth. That the nur of la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, the light of that, of a sinful, disobedient ob- believer, were unveiled for us, it would fill everything between the heavens and earth. And then he said, so what do you think about a righteous believer? What do you think then about someone who is on the path to walaya or has reached walaya? And so just to reflect on the value of, of Tawheed, that really ask ourselves, how precious is faith? And then Tawheed, this is the name of this science, one of the, one of the names, and there's many names of the science. Tawheed literally means to make something one or to deem something one, right? And, uh, or to affirm the uniqueness of an entity, to affirm the uniqueness of an entity. And so it's translated as monotheism often. And uh, it, it is connected with the way, this is the way of every prophet, and specifically in the Qur'an, the Qur'an talks about the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam, at the path or the way, the practice, the approach of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, al hanifiya that he was the Hanif, and the han- Hanafa is to incline, and so the Hanif is the one that's always inclining towards Tawheed, that in every situation to incline towards Tawheed, for the heart to incline towards Allah's oneness, and this is specifically important during tribulation, is that during tribulation, and this is something inshallah we'll discuss, that the issue of um, theodicy or the problem of evil, that the Islamic solution to that problem, what's seen as a problem in the West, uh, is really just affirming Tawheed. Is that no matter how difficult the situation, to hold on to the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His oneness. And that manifesting that, you know, one of the scholars, he said on his deathbed, he was, he was in, on his deathbed and he said that, مِنْ أَمَرَاتِ التَّأْيِيدِ حِفْظَ التَّوْحِيدِ فِي أَوْقَاتِ الْحُكُمْ مِنْ أَمَرَاتِ التَّأْيِيدِ حِفْظَ التَّوْحِيدِ فِي أَوْقَاتِ الْحُكُمْ That from the indications of divine help, from the indications that Allah is helping someone, is that Tawheed is preserved during times of tribulation. Amongst the indications that Allah is helping someone, is that Tawheed is preserved during times of tribulation. And that he was undergoing so much pain at that time. He was undergoing so much pain at that time, Rahimullah Ta'ala, that he further commented and he said that it's he said it's essentially for the axes for the for the axes of the divine decree to cut you up piece by piece while your state is Alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah. Alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah. Alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah. To hold on to that, to hold on to shukr to Allah, no matter how hard the test is, it's very difficult. It's very difficult, and this is something that we strive to do. And so, you know, we can start with the minor complaints that our hearts murmur with all the time, and and the complaints that manifest on the tongue. Just to hold complaints. One of our teachers said, every every single complaint is is essentially a complaint to Allah. Every single complaint is a complaint to Allah. And that the scholars, that the salaf, that even if they had to, for example, see a physician, and what does the physician ask? The first thing they ask is the chief complaint. What's the problem? What are you coming in for? 
that the scholars would say, just say Alhamdulillah when you say it. It's okay to say it because you're taking treatment, you're receiving treatment, just say Alhamdulillah. Sprinkle any complaint that has to come out with Alhamdulillah, if the, either on the tongue or at least in the heart. Just to hold on to Alhamdulillah. And so Tawheed really is, is, is at the heart of the response to the problem of evil. And uh, this, so this is one of the names. Another name of the science is Usul al-Din which is, means the foundations of the religion, because really the belief in Allah is the basis of all of the religious sciences. And this has to do with the nisbah, the relationship between this science and every science is that this is foundational. Another name that is, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, Allah be pleased with him, gave is Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar, the greatest uh, understanding, the greatest understanding, because the, the lesser fiqh is the law, the sacred law, and, the, and, and, and i.e. just relatively, because what value or what importance is the law if someone but doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So the primarily the foundation is to believe in Allah. That's usul al-din, the asl. And then the rest of the religion is built upon it. Another name of the relig of this science is aqidah. So this is the fourth name we're mentioning, aqidah. It comes from a root aqada, which means rabata, to tie. And so the idea is the aqidah is what we tie to our hearts or what we tie to our minds. And it has to be a firm, firm knot as it were. And so the definition of i'tiqad, they say, is al-jazm al-mutabiq lil-waqi' which we covered in, in some of our classes, that al-jazm al-mutabiq lil-waqi' that it is certainty, absolute certainty, that corresponds with reality. That i'tiqad, or aqidah, the, they, our masters define it as al-jazm, certainty, absolute certainty, al-mutabiq lil-waqi' that corresponds to reality. And so this is in the West, it's called the correspondence theory of truth, that we believe that there is objective reality. We believe that there is an ultimate truth to know, that it's not relative, that everyone has their own version of, it, of the truth, and that's just their truth versus our truth versus et cetera, et cetera, that there is one objective capital T truth, and that i'tiqad is to have certainty that corresponds to that reality, true i'tiqad, true aqidah, sound, real belief, is that it corresponds to reality. And the ultimate reality, because one of the names of Allah Ta'ala is Al-Haq. Right? One of the names of Allah Ta'ala is Al-Haq. So we affirm the realities of things, but ultimately those are a manifestation of the ultimate reality. And that goes back to what we started with the signs, that reading the ayat and learning to perceive what everything is pointing to and training our heart to open its basira for that. And so as Imam Nasafi rahimahullah, starts his creed with, which is an important, uh, this was a central creed taught in most of the madar, madar, madaris, the colleges or seminaries of our, of our uh, tradition, in our, in our history, is that qala uh, ahlul haqq, the people of the truth, capital T. Again, he starts off, qala ahlul haqq, the people of the truth, capital T, affirm, haqqa'iqul al-ashya thabitatun that the realities of things are affirmed. حَقَائِقُ الْأَشْيَاءَ ثَابِتَةٌ That things are real and their essences are real. وَالْعِلْمُ بِهَا مُتَحَقِّقٌ And knowledge of those essences is real, is affirmed. That things are real and they have essences and we can actually know those essences. خلاف in the Contrary to the sophists who would uh, try to deny that. And so these are self-evident in our tradition. These are, these are the starting point. This is the, this is the starting point of our epistemology, is that we affirm that things are real and they have essences, and that we can know those essences, and based on that, we can learn about the world. And when the argument of our theologians and masters is that once those two statements are affirmed, that حَقَاقُ الْأَشْيَاءَ ثَابِتَةٌ وَالْعِلْمُ بِهَا مُتَحَقِّقٌ the essences of, essences of things are real, and the no, and knowledge of that is affirmed. Once, the, once that is affirmed, and once a person accepts that, then they are thrust into a tsunami of signs. They are thrust into a tsunami of ayat, because everything is pointing. And what's underlying everything is la ilaha illallah. What's underlying everything is huwa al-awwalu wal akhiru wal dhahiru wal batin that he is the first without beginning. He is the last without end. He is the one that is manifest through the athar of his rahmah, the traces of his mercy, and he is the one who is hidden because his essence cannot be known. That we know him through the manifestation of his attributes, but his essence is ultimately unknowable except for him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So aqidah is important and, and understanding our epistemology vis-a-vis -vis truth. And then the last name is kalam. The fifth name of the science is kalam. And it, has, it means speech and that there's many reasons our, uh, our scholars give for why the science was called speech. Uh, two of the most common ones that they give is that uh, there was a lot of debate when it came to theology. There was a lot of debate. And so there's a lot of kalam amongst the mutakallimun, the people of discourse. And this is a type of uh, dialectic that ultimately, historically what happened is that you know, in the, in the early period of the Salaf, there was no need for a formalized theology because Surah Ikhlas was enough and the presence of the best of creation وسلم, was more than enough that a Sahabi, someone who has simply believed in the Prophet وسلم, and existed at his time and, be, and to have been in his company, two things to make someone a Sahabi is that they're in the company of the Prophet وسلم, and they believe in him وسلم. And by those two things, suddenly they are elevated in rank to the highest degree after prophets. That the, the blessing of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is so tremendous that simply to believe in Allah and to believe in him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and to simply be in his company, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, elevates one's rank to that extent. That's enough of a theology. That, that's the ultimate ayah. And they say, actually, that's the ultimate karama, the greatest karama that any non-profit can have, the greatest saintly miracle that any non-profit can have is to be a companion of, a, of the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To be a companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the greatest karama. This is the greatest karama. So what's the need of a formalized, rational discourse to defend beliefs? You see it, you taste it, you live it, you breathe it. But uh, over time then, in after one, two generations, then you have the, the ummah is spreading and you have an influx of people from different traditions, whether through conversion. So you have Jewish converts, Christian converts, converts, Buddhist converts in the area of Samarkand, etc., in the Far East, and uh, uh, people of all sorts of, you know, philosophers, and then what, so whether they're converting or they don't convert, but the Muslim Ummah now is in contact, in contact with theologians of different traditions and uh, philosophers, and then you have Greek uh, Hellenistic tradition that's translated uh, in, into Arabic, right, al Ma'mun and the Darul Hikmah in Baghdad, and translating these Greek texts, and suddenly People are reading Plato and Aristotle, etc. So you have a lot of new thoughts coming in and a lot of new questions are being asked that were never asked before. And so the ulama, the ulama that inherited the creed of the Salaf, the creed, the aqidah of the early generations, now they have to come up with a formal, rational discipline uh, that's based on reason to defend the creed. So they make a distinction between aqidah and kalam in the sense that aqidah is personal theology. And it's essentially simple. It's something anyone can learn and it's surah ikhlas is sufficient in essence. A basic understanding of Allah's oneness and then the articles of faith that we believe in messengers and angels and books and the yawm al-qiyamah and the qadr, the, the predestiny, it's good and it's evil. But kalam is sort of like an armor. It's, it's to protect that from any sort of what's called a shub shubha, obfuscation, or a confusing type of uh, a matter that can be introduced to, to the mind of the believer. That kalam is there to provide a reason-based defense of the creed that was inherited by the salaf. And so Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, he likens it to medicine. That he says that kalam is medicine. And not everyone has a, the sickness that this medicine is to treat. Is, is suitable for treating. That some people, they don't have this sickness. And as we know with medicine, if a person is healthy, giving them medicine will actually harm them. That their ilmul kalam, the formal, uh, rational, discipline, dialectical theology, discursive theology, is not for everyone. And for some people who don't have these questions, it can create questions and it can create doubts. But there are certain people that do have this sickness. And it's arguable that today in our time, vis-a-vis -vis what people are learning in the universities, vis-a-vis -vis all of the ideologies and the versions of philosophy and scientism and how these things permeate all, 
arguably all the departments in a university, not only the philosophy department, that many people are in need of a contemporary kalam, a kalam, a, a dialectical, formalized discipline in this language today, right, to deal with today's issues. But in any case, uh, it's not for everyone. And if a person, and even for those that are sick, that need this medicine, uh, there's the chance of overdose. And Imam Ghazali, he, he admonishes scholars to be very careful as to they should diagnose the person and to see how much of this they will need. Because not enough won't be, will, will be insufficient, but too much will also be harmful. And so finding that balance. And it's a very, very important matter because, again, we're dealing with the foundational, the asl, the usul al-deen. And so we ask Allah Ta'ala to give us tawfiq in, in this matter, inshallah. So, um, uh, these are the names, the, the, the main names of the science, Tawheed, Usul al-Din, the Fiqh al-Akbar, Aqidah, and, and Kalam. And, uh, it's, um, you know, see the Abdul Murad, Allah protect him, that he says in one of his contentions that theology is the, is the quest for the least silly definition of God, Right? Theology is the quest for the least silly definition of God. And so the idea, just the idea of defining God, the idea of using reason to somehow categorize our understanding of the divine, at, essentially it's a very silly endeavor. But the, because of the need of doing so, we have to do it in the least silly manner. And you know, Imam Tahawi, he says that, تَعَالَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْحُدُودِ وَالْغَيَاتِ that Allah is exalted, transcendent above hudud, limits, and ghayat, ends. That Allah has no limits and He has no ends. And the word in Arabic for had, the, the plural of which is hudud, limit, is also the word for a definition. That the definition defines, it puts a limit around what you're trying to ascertain the meaning of. And so, how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be defined? And so, kulluma khatara bi barik fallahu khilafu dhalik. That anything that occurs to our minds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different from that. And our master Abu Bakr, Allah be pleased with him, that he said that al ajzu anil idraq idraq, that the inability to understand, the inability to grasp, the inability to grasp the divine is our grasping or understanding of the divine, is that he is beyond limit. And laysa kamitlihi shayt that there is nothing like him whatsoever. He has no equivalent whatsoever, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, as we mentioned with Imam al-Laqani, rahimahullah, that the biographers mentioned that he was jami' that he conjoined or combined bayna sharia wal haqiqa that he combined between the outward expression of the law and the inward realities of the tradition, is that it's important to mention in any discussion of theology that real theology is what is what could be called a spiritual or experiential theology. Is that, uh, you know, one of my teachers, he said that he doesn't like Ilm al-Kalam because his knowledge of Allah is through his relationship with Allah. He said his knowledge of Allah is through his, you know, treading the spiritual path and drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that he said that he knew of a teacher in one of the institutes in the Muslim world who was a teacher of theology, and that every day he was teaching the names and attributes of Allah, that Allah is Ar-Razaq, and Allah is the provider, and He is the one that gives sustenance. And he did that, that was his profession, and that one day he got fired. And he said that he completely fell apart. And this, my teacher, he was thinking to himself, what happened to Ar-Razaq? What happened to the one that you used to teach about every day? And so the theologian has to be someone who is realized in these meanings. The theologian has to be someone who is, uh, these meanings are real, and they're ex embodied in his relationship with Allah SWT, in who he is or who she is. And so, uh, that even in our manuals of spirituality, there's a bab of tawheed, right? And even in our manuals of spirituality, there is a bab of tawheed, that tawheed is something that it's not limited to just kalam or dialectical theology, that it is, there is a spiritual theology. And that uh, one of the one of our masters that he defined tawheed, he said that, and this is mentioned in Imam Qushayri's Risala, that he said, "At tawheed isqatul yaat." 
He said, At-Tawheed isqatu al-ya'at. And he said, La taqul minni, wa la ilayya, wa la anni. He said that the ya in Arabic, ya, is the pronoun that refers to me. So when I attach it to a word, I say, for example, kitabi, my book, waraqati, my paper, haqibati, my bag. So the e sound is the letter ya in Arabic. And he said, one of our masters said that tawheed is to drop the, the me and the mine and the myself and the I from the heart. It's to absolve oneself from that. As that, to the sense of ownership, the sense of entitlement that really is afflicting our age today specifically. That there's a book called The Narcissism Epidemic by Twenge and Campbell, I think, that it's called, you know, The Age of Entitlement and how narcissism is an epidemic. And this is a, from a non theological lens and just looking at a, the phenomenon of culture today and how people are, is that narcissism is not simply. You know, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM, that psychiatrists use in medicine, that there's actually a disease now called NPD, Narcissistic Personality Disorder. Narcissistic Personality Disorder, that actually physicians diagnose people with, that it's too much. There's too much ana in the heart. And they're not even looking from a theological perspective. There's no Quran, Sunnah, no sacred tradition informing their view, simply looking at the way people are. And so, a fortiori for us, yani minbab ola, as they say, you know, what about us that we have Quran and Sunnah? We have the, the blessing of the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we're in the ummah of the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that this jawhara, this precious, precious pearl of tawheed that we've been honored with, Right, just to have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that to really to take it upon ourselves to implement it in our hearts and to let go of the ana. And that one a good thing to do is that anytime we see our name or a resume or any sort of achievement, just to make istighfar. Just the moment you see your name, just astaghfirullah. Really, it's a really good thing to do. Because لِتَكُنْ كَلِمُتُ اللَّهِ هِيُ الْعُلْيَا That the whole point is that Allah's name is up. That Allah's name reigns supreme. And so even if we see our names, we should just make a tawbah. Just ask Allah to forgive us. It's a good thing, inshallah. It won't hurt, inshallah. That one of our masters, Al-Wasiti, he says that أَقْرَبُ شَيْءٍ إِلَى مَقْتِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى رُؤْيَةُ النَّفْسِ وَأَفْعَالِهَا أَقْرَبُ شَيْءٍ إِلَى مَقْتِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى رُؤْيَةُ النَّفْسِ وَأَفْعَالِهَا That the very closest thing to Allah's punishment and, and Allah's despising of someone is for them to see themselves, for him to see himself and his actions, for him to see himself, just to see himself, just to affirm oneself and one's achievements. And so Tawheed, the reality of Tawheed is min, you know, fandur ila athari rahmatillah, subhanallah, thank you, Ya Allah, what a gift you've given me, any achievement, material or spiritual, academic, physical, emotional, any sort of ability, talent, achievement that we have to attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Tawheed, they define isqatul ya'at, that just to let go of the ana. And that, um, and that Sidi Abdul Murad, in another contention, he says the point of theology is to silence the ego. As an echoing what that Imam said of isqatul ya'at, the point of theology is to silence the ego. And that, um, no, alhamdulillah. So inshallah to begin the text. That uh, he starts with the Bismillah, Bismillah rahman rahim which is actually not part of the poem, but uh, separately before he begins the poem, Bismillah rahman rahim So this is the Basmala, and it's the beginning of the Fatiha. And it is, uh, you know, the Ba in Arabic, there's two meanings they mention, Isti'ana and Musahaba. Isti'ana is to seek help. So it's the particle of seeking help, ba, or musahaba, the particle of seeking company. Okay, the particle of company, seeking company. So they say that the two meanings, therefore, are either bismillah, seeking the help of Allah's name, seeking the help of Allah's name, or musahaba, asking Allah that the barakah of Allah's name accompany one. 
it's asking, it's beseeching Allah that the barakah, the blessing of Allah's name accompany one in whatever they're about to engage in. And so the idea is of barakah. And barakah in Arabic has to do with ziyadah, increase. That with the same effort and the same amount of time, there are a lot more fruits. Right? With the same effort and the same amount of time, there are a lot more fruits. And a really nice example of that is the poem that in, is in front of us, Imam Laqani, wrote it in one night. Because of the barakah of the idhan, the permission from his spiritual mentor. And that really, it's seeking tawfiq as well. That we have to mention, the barakah is goes hand in hand with tawfiq. Tawfiq comes from a root that has to do with wifq. Wifq or wafq means to be harmonized with something. Okay, to be harmonized with something, to be according to something. So muwafaqa is an important term. Tawfiq is related to muwafaqa. For those studying Arabic in the West, it would be a form two tawfiq. Muwafaqa is a form three. So tawfiq is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create a muwafaqa a correspondence between the servant's actions and what he loves. Okay, for Allah Ta'ala to create in the servant actions that he loves, such that there is a muwafaqa, there is a correspondence or harmony between what the servant is, what they say, what they do, and what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala loves. And that the basis of this is tawfiq, that Allah creates it, that Allah creates it. And uh, one of the definitions of a wali, of a saint, is that man tawala taf'aluhu bil muwafaqa. That waliya, one of the meanings is tawala, which is successive, to be successive. So one of, one of the, the scholars, they define a wali as man tawala taf'aluhu, someone whose actions are successively, one after another, bil muwafaqa. They have this muwafaqa. There is a correspondence or a harmony every day, day in and day out, between the way they are and what they do and what they say and the, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And so the basmala is asking Allah for barakah and tawfiq. And that they mentioned that all of aqidah can be found in the basmala. All of aqidah can be found in the basmala because you have lafzul jalala, the divine name, the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that name entails... Uh, they say it refers to the one who is necessarily existent, who has, who is attributed with all of perfection, and is transcendent above, above all deficiency, and is deserving of all praise. This is how they explain lafzul jalala. They say uh, it's an alam, it's a proper name, ala uh, that al wajib al wujud, the entity that is necessarily existent. Okay, that is al muttasif bi bi. Uh, sifatul, kamal, sifatul Kamal that is ascribed with attributes of perfection al munazzah and Simat al Naqs that is transcendent above all deficiency wa al mustahiq al Jamil al Muhammad the one that deserves all praise and so that's what the meaning or what we can appreciate from the name Allah is that the one who cannot not be the one who cannot not be and that what he is, what he is entails that he is that al-wajib al-wujud, what he is, entails that he is. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be. And that, based off of that, he has all the attributes of perfection. And he is transcendent above all deficiency. And, uh, and he is al-mustahiq li jamil al-mahamid. He is deserving of all praise. Which is why, right after the basmala comes, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, in the fatiha. That as soon as we appreciate Allah, Subhanahu wa ta'ala and what that name refers to then alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin and that's his speech and so Allah himself subhanahu wa ta'ala says alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin so the one that knows his reality praises himself according to his reality and so one of our masters Abu Abbas al Mursi he said that what type of al is in alhamdulillah because in Arabic grammar there's different types of alif lam the particle the so some say that it's jinsiya, it refers to the universal, just praise, the universal term praise. That praise, the general meaning, is for Allah. And some say it's istighraq, it's all praise, every single praise ever is for Allah. And so Abu, Abu al-Bas al-Mursi, Allah be pleased with him, he said that actually it's, a, it's one specific praise. It's ahdiya, it's one specific praise. That Allah Ta'ala, when he, when he knew in pre-eternity, that creation would not be able to praise him as he deserves. When he knew in pre-eternity that creation would not be able to praise him as he deserves, he praised himself as is 
proper for him. And he said, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. He said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And that particular hamd is what's referred to with the al. Alhamd, that pre-eternal praise for himself, Lillah, is for Allah alone. And then out of mercy, he revealed it to us so that we can just echo that echo how he is praising himself subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is the reality of alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen according to some of our scholars and so he deserves all praise then ar-rahman ar-rahim the one who gives jala'il an ni'ama that they say jala'il an ni'am ar-rahman is the one that gives grand blessings that are apparent and magnificent faith guidance uh, whereas ar-rahim is the one that gives daqaiq an ni'am a subtle minor blessings like the salt that we put on our on our meat when we eat or the little bit of sauce that we have or the dressing on the salad so that Allah Ta'ala Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim He is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim and so all of this mercy that really creation can be understood as a manifestation of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim all of creation in this life and the next is a tajalli, a manifestation of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim and so if you look at the Basmala you have seeking the help of Allah Seeking the bar the help and, and blessing and tawfiq from Allah, Bismillah, the Lafdul Jalala, the one that deserves all praise, and essentially he is the one that praises himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, how he interacts with creation, that all of this is an extension of the most merciful in grand ways and the most merciful in subtle ways. And so all of the meanings of the Quran are in the Fatiha and all the meanings of the Fatiha are in the Basmala. And so all of our aqidah is actually in the Basmala. And then they say by extension that even the ba then, all of, the, all of that can be found in the ba. Because it's just billah. Everything is just by him. Everything that exists is billah. That in reality, the matter is as follows. There is rab and there is abd bi rab. The reality is as follows. All that exists is creator, Allah, and everything else that exists, billah, ba, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what our masters teach. That the entire aqidah, everything we need to know is in the letter ba. Everything we let her know, that we have to know. And that from our lens, what are the meanings of ba? Isti'ana, seeking Allah's help. And musahaba, seeking that company of the barakah and tawfiq. That really the point of the entire religion is to turn to him and to, just to ask him to bestow us with his help and to give us barakah and tawfiq, blessing and muwafaqah, that we are harmonized with what he loves. This is, this is the whole point. The whole point is in the ba. And of all, all of our aqidah is in the ba. And so subhanAllah, yani, reflect that this is only, how can this be just man-made? Just the basmala alone, this is from revelation. This is kalamullah. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reveal this. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reveal this. So, alhamdulillah, wa shukrillah. And then Imam al-Laqani begins, alhamdulillahi ala silatihi, thumma salamullahi ma'a salatihi. Alhamdulillahi ala silatihi, thumma salamullahi ma'a salatihi. So, alhamdulillah, we talked about that, that praise for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the type of al that uh, some of the scholars discussed and that hamd is really, uh, we translate it as praise. And the meaning that they mention is that Imam Bajuri and others, rahimahullah, is that hamd has to do with glorification and veneration. Hamd has to do with glorification and veneration. And the basis of it, Imam Bajuri and others mentioned, the basis of hamd, the basis of this glorification and veneration is based on jamal. The basis of hamd, true praise, is because of the jamal, the beauty of the one that's being praised. This is essentially what it is. Because they say that the difference between hamd and shukr, hamd meaning, meaning praise, shukr meaning gratitude, is that shukr is in response to a ni'mah. It's fi muqabala an ni'mah. It's in response to a blessing, that the, someone blesses us, and then we give gratitude for that blessing. Whereas hamd is independent of the blessing. Whether the person or the whatever we're praising, whether they blessed us or not, they're just in and of themselves deserving of praise because of beauty. 
And so in the realm of creation, for example, you see a beautiful constellation and you say, you know, wow, what a, what a beautiful constellation. So you, you praise that. It's a type of extillation. It's a type of glorification, type of extolling, type of veneration, respect, just ad admiration. These are all encompassed in the word hamd. Based on what though? Beauty. That it's essentially, our masters say, it's the beauty of something that is the basis of praise. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our beloved said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. That verily Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. Verily Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. Now what our masters have, they real, that what they are realized in vis-a-vis -vis this hadith, is that every single beauty that exists in the world is a tajalli of Allah's beauty. Every single beauty that is in creation is in essentially a manifestation, a reflection of the divine beauty. And so the people close to Allah, they don't just see the beautiful constellation. They think, subhanAllah, they think of Allah. They don't just experience the, the sweetness of a breeze. They think of Allah. That Allah Ta'ala says, Wallahu alladhi arsal al-riyah. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Wallahu alladhi arsal al-riyah. And Allah is the one i.e. the only one that's sending the winds. And so any experience that touches the heart and inculcate, uh, inculcates an appreciation for beauty is really a reflection of inna Allah jameelun, that verily Allah is the beautiful one. And so in essence, Allah is deserving of all praise because He is the one of beauty and He is the one who creates all of beauty in the cosmos. And then what's beautiful, how Imam Laqani did this, rahimullah, is that he says, Alhamdulillah, so we have praise, not in consideration of any blessing. Alhamdulillah, you have a mubtada and khabar, a subject and predicate, so a complete sentence. Alhamdulillah, not in consideration of any blessing. But then he says, Ala silatihi. Now we, we, oh, we go from hamd to shukr, because it's a second khabar. So now a second predicate. Pray all praise and the eternal praise for himself is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, due to his blessings. So now we have shukr in response to the blessings. And so silat is the plural of sila, which comes from wasala. And wasala means to arrive. And so it means ma wasala ilal ghair min al khair, that which arrives to someone else of good any good that arrives to someone else. And so Allah Ta'ala is gifting us all of these silat, all of these blessings at every moment. So Alhamdulillah, just in and of Himself, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is deserving of praise. But on top of that, ala silatihi, for all of these blessings that we're experiencing. And now to talk about shukr, that our masters say that shukr is, uh, it's, it's broader than hamd in that it's not simply verbal, that hamd is verbal. That, you, that it's a spoken, hamd, praise, is something that is spoken. Whereas shukr is three dimensions. Shukr has three dimensions. That it starts with the heart. It's an appreciation or a realization in the heart. And then it manifests on the tongue, right, to, sh to express the gratitude. And then it ultimately manifests in the limbs. Is that to do something f because of that blessing that was received. And so reflecting on all these is that you know, Imam al-Junaid, Allah be pleased with him, that he says that, Ashukr an la tara nafsaka ahlan in ni'ma. Ashukr an la tara nafsaka ahlan in ni'ma. That gratitude is that you, 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 don't, you see yourself as not worthy of the blessing. Gratitude is that you see yourself as not worthy of the blessing. And so just a state of humility, that one of the states of the heart, initial state of the heart, when one receives a blessing, is just to be humbled. This is, the, this is the way that the people of Allah are, is that they're humbled by their blessings. It doesn't feed their egos. And there's a narration that Allah Ta'ala revealed to Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, Prophet Jesus alayhi salam, that in, إِذَا أَنْعَمْتُ عَلَيْكَ بِنِعْمَةٍ That if I grant you any blessing, فَاسْتَقْبِلْهَا istikana, Then receive it with brokenness. If I grant you any blessing, فَاسْتَقْبِلْهَا istikana. Istikana is to be utterly humbled and just broken. Like, what did I do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve my eyes? That every single day I can see all of this. What did I do to deserve my ears? That I can hear all of these things. What did I do to deserve my speech? That I'm able to, you know, I was reading about a man that had a certain type of cancer in the brain. And the surgeon was actually operating on the brain and he was actually conscious at the time. They were able to go in and operate while he was conscious. 
and that he said that he was fine and the doctor was like okay do you do you notice anything different as he was doing do you notice anything different and he said at one point he did something and suddenly i couldn't speak that i was trying to say things and i just couldn't speak because he had he had affected the area that of the brain that deals with speech and it took him so many months to recover his speech and eventually he recovered it but just imagine that just try like one day of just not speaking and every time you want to say something just imagine that you couldn't do that you know what did we deserve to what did we do to deserve speech that we just you know they say that the wise man his his uh, tongue is behind his heart because he doesn't speak unless he processes is this something that's beneficial or not and the foolish one is someone whose heart is in front of his tongue it's all the way out in his mouth that anything that he thinks just rolls right out anything any any thought just comes right out immediately there's no filter to see is this something to be said or not right man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir falyaqul khayran aw liyasmut whoever believes in allah in the last day let him speak well or just keep silent that takes a certain level of monitoring right of watching over and so a part of the appreciation then appreciating speech and realizing so fastaqbilha bil istikana receive it receive the blessing with a sense of you know i don't deserve this and then the narration ends utammimha alayk utammimha alayk if you do that i will complete the blessing for you if you do that if your if the state of the heart is brokenness and a sense of not deserving it opposite of entitlement the opposite of narcissism now i will take it and i will give the baraka and tawfiq in that blessing what we started the discussion on with the basmala is that the 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 fruits of that utammimha alayk the narration ends to say na isa alayhi salam that if you receive it with istikana if you receive it with a sense of brokenness i will complete it and you will taste the fruits of that ni'ma in ways that are unimaginable and so then this is you know because that's the state of the heart and then it gratitude then secondly on the tongue is that when someone realizes that they don't deserve these blessings alhamdulillah ala silatihi that to express gratitude alhamdulillah wa shukru lillah alhamdulillah rabbil alamin thank you ya allah to making a habit of infusing our speech with the praise of allah and gratitude to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that part of gratitude on the tongue is that we stop complaining and this is advice to myself and everyone really tell yourself khalas i'm done with complaining it's it's over no more complaining i'm not going to complain anymore and if i ever have to in a situation of need i have to see a physician i need to get some counsel from a family member from a friend i'm going to sprinkle that speech with alhamdulillah i'm going to sprinkle that or my heart if it's something that you know the doc- a doctor might find it awkward you're saying arabic phrases all the time you need to try it i don't know but otherwise if it's something that's just in the heart alhamdulillah alhamdulillah i'm having some stomach problems alhamdulillah alhamdulillah i'm having some heart problems chest pain alhamdulillah alhamdulillah i'm having i'm seeing funny things with my eyes alhamdulillah alhamdulillah really just to inculcate that gratitude on the tongue and then on the limbs is that that this should be expressed with a sincere effort to serve allah is that the one of the one of the fruits of gratitude is that it manifests in the limbs of the person saying i want to serve allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i want to devote myself to serving him subhanahu wa ta'ala for his sake and that one of our masters ruwaim allah be pleased with him that he said a shukr istifraq at-taqa he says a shukr istifraq at-taqa is to empty yourself of energy is to exhaust yourself of energy is that the sahaba when it was time for salat al-isha they were literally nodding off waiting for the salat al-isha to come because they were so tired of serving allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that entire day they were so exhausted every day of serving allah that literally just making it to isha was a ta- was a tall task and so really like examine ourselves that how are we spend our time how do we spend our energy and out of gratitude for these blessings these silat the is a has to do with wusul wasala is a connection that this silat is our sila to allah allah you know he's connecting himself with us through giving us all of these blessings we should connect to him by responding and exhausting ourselves for his sake subhanahu wa ta'ala and so really just to that this manifest that we should we should be tired we should be tired our limbs should be tired for, from serving allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of gratitude to him 
Alhamdulillahi ala salati. Thumma salamu alayhi ma salati. So inshallah, uh, if Allah gives us tawfiq, we will try to uh, continue with our discussion, beginning with sending blessings, invoking blessings and peace on the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive us and give us tawfiq and barakah in these meanings. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Nabi Lumi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We have about five minutes for questions. If there are any questions on the brothers or sisters' side, we can pass the mic around, inshallah. Just raise your hand. One second. Zakallah Sheikh. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit more on Haqaiq al Ashya Thabita wal Ilmu biha mutahaqq or mutahaqq? Inshallah. Just a little bit. I intend to do that next class, inshallah. Okay. Because he's going to talk about Deen al Haqq. Fa arshad al Khalq li Deen al Haqq, the true religion. Inshallah, we'll discuss that in more detail. Okay. How did you translate it again? I just missed that. Haqaiq al Ashya Thabita, the essences of things are real. The essences or the quiddi- the quiddities of things are real. Uh, and knowledge of those essences is something that is affirmed, and it exists. Both of these things exist. Khilaf in the contrary to what the Sufists say, who were um, funny philosophers. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Sir. Is there, so. is there okay. can I ask a question? No. Um, so in theology one, we're doing the Tahawi. So in comparison to the Tahawi, which is more general and agreed upon by all schools, is this leading towards a certain school, or is this uh, how is this in comparison to the Tahawi? Mashallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala return Sheikh Hamza safely. I mean. And he's, uh, alhamdulillah, inshallah, he's the one to answer. <coughs> but... Um, just from my limited knowledge that the, basically, uh, you know, the Johara is, uh, Imam Laqani is Ashari, okay? So it's a presentation of the Ashari um, school. And uh, classically you had the Ashari's and the Maturidis who, you know, you look up any uh, classical text of, of theology and they, they will mention that the, the Wadir, the founder of this science, and inshallah will do the, the Mabad al-Ashara next class, the, the ten essential elements of the science, but that the wa that one of the ten essential elements is who is the founder. And they mentioned that it's uh, Imam Abu Hassan al-Ashari, Allah be pleased with him, who died 324, and uh, uh, Imam Abu Mansur al-Maturidi, Allah be pleased with him, who died 333 after Hijra. Um, those are the two Imams that are mentioned primarily as the founders of this, the Kalam, or the, the dialectical uh, theology. Um, whereas Tawheed, as its reality, they'll, they'll clarify um, that it's from it's what every prophet brought, right? So Tawheed, as its reality, is what from Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is what was brought. But as a as a codified, organized, systematized discipline, it, it was it was um, you know formalized in that sense by Imam Ashari, Imam Maturidi, and their respective schools. Uh, the Tahawiyah, Imam Tahawi died 321, and so he's in that same time period, and he writes the Tahawiyah, and he starts off saying, this is the, uh, this is the aqidah of the fuqaha, of the millah, Abu, uh, Abu Hanifa, rahimullah ta'ala, and Abu Yusuf, and Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan, a shaybani Allah be pleased with them. So he is conveying the creed, the aqidah, the personal theology, that he inherited from his teachers, as, as is presented by uh, the Hanafis. Right, as is presented by the Hanafis. And, and it's simple difference of presentation and semantics between the Ashuris, Maturidis, and the, this presentation of Imam Tahawi. 
within the Hanafis, you have the Tahawi's creed, and then you have the Maturi, the Imam Maturi, who's also Hanafi. So the Hanafiya, which is used not only for fiqh, but also in usul al-din, in aqidah, you'll see that they'll say, sometimes they'll refer to the Maturidiyya as al Hanafiya. So the, the Hanafis, there's a, a more uh, knuckle-based approach, which is based off of just pure revelation and systemata- syst- systematically presenting an, an organized an organized presentation of the beliefs that are extracted from revelation. That would be more like Imam Tahawi's creed. <clears throat> Whereas the um, Imam Maturidi, he has, he has more of a synthesis between what's called aql and naql, is that both reason and revelation synthesized, which is the, the foundation for the way he presents. So the, the personal theology part, the, the creedal aspect, the aqidah is not different. It's subtle, subtle things. Uh, secondary issues or semantic a lot of it a lot of it is semantic but the the approach and how much weight to give to reason and how much how discursive it is that differences there is difference between obviously the Imam Tahawis which is purely creedal whereas the Maturidi and Ashari presentations which are uh, dialectical right and that, that the Tahawi creed then it you know that you have this um, strain of the what's called the Atharis so those that prefer just the knuckle based approach just just presenting the aqidah that is derived from revelation that's there and uh, and you know in the Hanbali madhab of fiqh you have what Sidi Abdul Hakim Murad calls soft Hanbalism and hard Hanbalism that you have a soft Hanbalism which is more athari just presenting the creed and not really getting into some of the dialectical issues at all and then you have sort of a hard Hanbalism which is a tendency to be literalist that does exist and Ibn Jawzi Rahimallah, who is a Hanbali himself, refutes that strain of the literalist tendency that 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 is there historically. So, inshallah, Sheikh Hamza will explain these things in much much better uh, detail. Alhamdulillah. Any other questions? We have one last question in the back. He just raised his hand. I was gonna, I was going to cap it. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain what exactly is meant by dialectical or, or, or discursive theology. Yeah, so it's basically just um, here's the argument, uh, here's the premise of the other side, here's the rebuttal of the Sunni scholars. This is why this is incorrect, and then they'll they will they will rebut or refute, they'll try to refute that, and then there's a ref- refutation. So it's a back and forth dialectical or discursive. It's it's based off of uh, you know, logic-based um, argumentation, formal, formal, a formal discipline of argumentation. Argumentation in the sense not of, you know, a, a sense of a, a reason-based um, discourse. You know, so this particular group says this. The, w- they're incorrect because their premises don't lead to their conclusions. There's a fallacy there, and so therefore this is correct. And it's basically using logic to defend the aqidah, defend the, the personal theology that every believer uh, is responsible to know. So not every believer has to know the di- dialectical. That's, on, that's what's called a fard kifaya. Inshallah, we'll discuss it next time. A fard kifaya, which is a communal obligation. And they actually say in every locality, it's not just in the ummah that there has to be people that are qualified to do this. They actually say in every locality, in every area of the ummah, there has to be people that can do what's called raddu shubuhat, a refutation of obfuscation, a refutation of issues that could cause confusion to the believer. And traditionally, this was done through this discourse, this dialectic. And uh, I think we can appreciate today the need for this, especially in, in you know, the modern university setting and all of the different ideologies and, and philosophies that, are, that, are, that we're faced with. But uh, uh, that the, the fard kifaya, the communal obligation, is that in every place there is someone qualified to to protect, essentially, the, our aqidah, and to, def- to defend it, to clarify it, and to remove any potential confusion in, in the mind of the believer. Can I take a question from one line, please? Okay, uh, Sister Maha asks, if truth is objective and self-evident, then how do we explain committed people of other faiths as believers of their truth. Many of them are better than Muslims in their practices and in other contributions. Right, so truth is objective. Uh, the 
what we discussed from Imam Nasifi's creed, that's what we were trying to say, that these are self-evident, that the fact that there is a reality, that that reality has has a nature, essence, and that we can know that, that our, our theologians argue that those are self-evident. And inshallah, maybe next class, we'll get into some of the, the details of that. In terms of uh, other people that are committed, you know, our theologians would argue that we can, based off of reason, we can show fallacies in their theology, right? And so we have what are called barahin, right? One of the texts in our tradition is the Umm al-Barahin, Imam Sanusi's creed, which was taught all over uh, the madaris, the seminaries uh, historically of the Muslim lands, that you know he has for each of the attributes that we affirm in our theology, he has a burhan, he has a a demonstrative proof, an apodictic proof, that is bit, that whose premises are premises of certainty, and that you know our theologians were able to show the fallacies in the in the in the other other uh, theologies which we believe are 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 false if they don't have the same you know tawhid that we that we affirm. So you know we do we do. Uh, uh, affirm that, and that's in the realm of kalam. The mutakallimun, they'll actually get into this uh, dialectic and the details of how each of these uh, arguments or each of the other perspectives are are refutable. How we refute that? No. Thank you. Can I take one more, or is there another from the floor? Okay, I'm sorry. Can I take one more from sure. the online audience? Um, so the term kalam is more used in a way that concerns the protection of the creed, while aqida is more individual? Right. Yeah, aqida is one's personal beliefs, and kalam is this enterprise of discourse to defend, protect, clarify those beliefs, and to remove any confusion that could come into the mind of the believers specifically vis-a-vis -vis other perspectives, right? To, to to protect them from that and to refute those obfuscations, what's called the radd shubuhat. That's in the in the realm of kalam, right? Okay. And then can I have one more for the odd number? Inshallah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, do the imams of Tasawwuf teach about Aqidah differently than the Imams of Kalam? And which books from the Imams of Tasawwuf would you recommend on Aqidah? Uh, from what I've been exposed to, the Imams of Tasawwuf teach the same creeds, right? Teach the same creeds as the, you know, the, the works of Aqidah. So the Umm al-Barahin, for example, Imam Sanusi's creed that was taught in all of the in many, many of our madaris historically, that uh, you know, the the a lot of the uh, teachers of tasawwuf will make sure that a basic creed like that is learned well by their by their um, students or those that are uh, taking uh, uh, spiritual teachings from them, uh, or the johara, for example. A lot of them use the johara, what we're studying here. So the creed is the same creed, and they teach it, you know, in the same manner, but. Uh, when they teach tasawwuf, they would probably connect the experiential element that they're teaching, that they're opening the doors for, or they're at least showing the way for. They'll probably connect that to the aqidah in a very unique and profound way. So, alhamdulillah, that's my limited understanding. There's just one last question from the floor, and that'll be the final question, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. alaikum salam. Thank you, Sheikh. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, so, in the in the postmodern world which we live right now, it's all relative. And uh, and you mentioned that this science can be like an armor. Uh, but you also mentioned that the prerequisite is to believe in the absolute. For this to, can, I might have misunderstood it, but if you could clarify that a little bit. Yeah, so inshallah, hopefully, next class we'll talk about that, that the beginning of Imam Nasifi's creed. But, you know, there are certain uh, premises that we, we sort of, we hold as self-evident. And we hold them as intuitive, that this world is real. 
you know, Imam Ghazali in his Munqid Min Al-Dalal, he talks about how he faced sort of a crisis of skepticism and he started doubting everything. And he said it wasn't a doubt of faith, he was still a believer and he practiced Islam, but internal doubt of what he called fact, just how can he know things. And he said that for two months he was afflicted with this and that he said the way it ended is something he can't describe. And he said that Allah cast a light into his heart. He said that's how he got out of it, is that God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just cast a light into his heart. And so then he had full conviction of these self-evident premises that there is objective reality and we can know this reality. Um, so, you know, you, you, you know, uh, inshallah we'll talk about it and, and uh, there are arguments that we use to defend you know why we why these premises are true, but a skeptic can always just say, "How do you know? How do you know? How do you know?" And that's a type of what we would call sophistry. That they're just, you know, Imam Taftazani says that if someone is like that, they're denying the realities of things. Then just take a match and light it under their under their hand, and just ask them, "Is it real?" <laughs> now I'm not inciting to violence. Please, <laughs> alhamdulillah. It's just an example, is that people that try to do the sophistry, if you examine their lives, is one of two situations. Either they're hypocrites because they take life seriously. They'll get a job. When they're hungry, they eat. Why do you eat if things aren't real? Don't eat. Why do you speak? Why are you engaging the world? Why do you have a family? Why do you send your kid to school and soccer practice in the afternoon? Why do you do that? It's, it's hypocritical. You treat the world as if it's real. So just now... Let's extend now, right? Let's say, okay, this world has meaning and let's look, let's, let's examine it because, and then these are the barahin, the every, you know, the, the proofs for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that's the first case is that they're completely hypocritical and you just have to point that out. Or the second case is they go mad and that happens. You have philosophers that literally go mad because they are such skeptics. They can't speak anymore. They can't function in the world and they go crazy. And many of them commit suicide. And so you just say, look, you have one of two options, you know, but we are very fulfilled people, alhamdulillah. Even during tribulation, that's the beauty of Islam, is even during tribulation, the believer is someone with dignity. The believer is someone with dignity, is that they take the tribulation with dignity. And it, we're not belittling. Tribulation can be very, very difficult. And we always ask Allah for afiyah. We ask Him for well-being and protection and safety and security for all of the Muslims. But those that are facing it, they have a dignity. And that they perceive the ma'na, they perceive behind all of this is some meaning. And that meaning is real. And I want to seek that meaning. And it's all pointing to who al awwalu wal akhiru wal zahiru wal batin. That he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is transcendent above time and space. He is manifesting himself at every moment. And his reality is al batin. He is completely ungraspable, he, we, uh, incomprehensible, his reality. And that all I want to do is be with him. And I want to seek him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, I, and I beg him for his good pleasure. And that gives meaning, that infuses meaning. And to the extent that the person of Allah, that the, the mundane becomes meaningful. It's so beautiful because now suddenly, you know, drinking a sip of water has meaning. Because they start with the basmala. And we talked about the basmala and all that's entailed by the bismillah rahman rahim And they end with alhamdulillah. And we talked about alhamdulillah today and all that's entailed with gratitude. So suddenly something seemingly mundane becomes al baqiyatu salihat eternal good deeds immortal immortal good deeds that when they put on the garment they say alhamdulillah alladhi kasani hadha praise be to allah that clothed me in this wa razaqanihi and gifted it to me min ghayri hawlin minni wala quwwah i mean there's an entire theology in that dua without any might or power on my behalf so suddenly something as mundane as putting on clothes it becomes baqiyatu salihat immortal good deeds so we would argue that just choose for yourself, right? We seek beauty, we seek meaning. And trust me, it's real. Wallahu alam. Alhamdulillah.